Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, the review show concerning films based on books and how the former compares to the latter. And we've had a few satisfying episodes recently, some very loyal adaptations that really understood the message of their source material. That streak has finally ended I'm afraid, as I feel forced to invoke the in-name only clause on today's adaptation, Johnny Mnemonic. For any new beautiful watchers in the audience, I usually follow a strict format of categories in these episodes, but when the film in question has very little in common with the book it renders that slightly pointless, so instead I choose to describe both the book and the film relatively separately, and only discuss the most interesting or ironic changes. Let's start at the beginning though. William Gibson is an American-born author who emigrated to Canada to avoid the possibility of being drafted into the Vietnam War. He's renowned as being an influential figure in the creation of the cyberpunk genre, and is even credited with coining the term cyberspace. I fear this uncomplicated description is probably doing quite a complicated man a bit of a disservice, but I only have so much time for the history segments of these reviews, so you are cordially invited to to look him up for yourself if you're interested. His short story, Johnny Mnemonic, was originally published in a magazine in 1981, then republished in 1986 in Burning Chrome, a collection book of Gibson's best work to date. While technically a standalone story, Johnny Mnemonic takes place in the same universe as several other Gibson books, in which Johnny's friend, Molly Millions, is a recurring character. In 1995, a film adaptation made its way to cinemas. It was directed by Robert Longo, another complicated man with a rich history that I'm going to have to condense down into an oversimplification of saying that he was primarily a painter and a sculptor who occasionally directed some music videos and TV episodes. The screenplay was written by a man called William Gibson, who... Uh, yeah. Well, my beautiful watchers, it appears we have something new today. The first in-name only film to feature on Lost in Adaptation that was adapted by the author of the book. This is going to take some explaining. Before that though, let's talk about said book. In an unspecified future year, the world, and in particular America, has undeniably gone a tad downhill. Rampant, unchecked capitalism has eventually led to a dystopian future where super powerful corporations seize power from the government and ran the country into the ground, allowing the Japanese organized crime syndicate known as the Yakuza to take over not only large parts of Japan, but also absorb the Chinese triads and the American mafia, making themselves a worldwide criminal organization with extraordinary reach. The story takes place in a megacity called The Sprawl that form from every city along the east coast between Boston and Atlanta, growing so large they merge together and now exist under massive domes that control all light and the local environment. Another important thing to know about this particular dystopian future is plastic surgery is considered a normal fashion practice and cybernetic and mechanical body augmentation is equally commonplace. In fact, the tale's protagonist Johnny starts the story with a brand new face that he recently purchased, so he could get close to his former employer without him realizing until it's too late. Johnny works as a data courier. He has a storage system implanted inside his head that he can use to transport information for people who consider it too important, sensitive, or illegal to transfer over the internet. The info is password protected by a phrase that Johnny doesn't know, and he goes into a trance as he uploads and downloads it to ensure full secrecy for his clients. His newest client, Ralphie Face, paid him to pick up some data, but after Johnny did so, he discovered that instead of arranging to collect it, Ralphie put out a hit on his courier instead. Dead. To find out why, Johnny sneaks into Ralphie's casino with a sword-off shotgun hidden in a gym bag, an assault so crude he hoped no one would think to take precautions against it. Unfortunately, Ralphie did and paralyzes Johnny with a neural disruptor installed under his table. He reveals to Johnny that he found out too late that the info he purchased was stolen from the Yakuza, and he thinks that his only chance of escaping their vengeance is by throwing Johnny under the bus and handing him over to them. All seems lost for poor Johnny, but he is miraculously saved by a woman known as, amongst other things, Molly Millions, who just happened to be passing and is looking for work as a bodyguard. If you're really into cyberpunk, then Molly is the woman of your dreams. She has massive body augmentations, including reflective metal lenses installed permanently over her eyes, and scalpel sharp blades that can extend out of her fingertips like the scary young lady from X-Men 2. Ralphie's henchman tries to rough her up, but without any apparent effort, she slices through the tendons on his wrist and takes the remote control for the neuralizer. Once freed, Johnny outbids Ralphie to hire her, and they take Ralphie hostage. Not for long though, as a Yakuza assassin turns up, to start teaching some lessons about not fucking with them. The Yakuza apparently clone and grow their foot soldiers in vats before training them to be near-perfect warriors. This one is armed with a prosthetic thumb containing a coiled monomolecular wire. That's a wire so ridiculously thin and strong, he can whip it around and cut through just about anything, including Ralphie, who he slices into three pieces. And Johnny manages to temporarily drive him off with his shotgun, but quickly realizes he's super screwed if he doesn't get this info out of his head and send it back to the Yakuza. He explains to Molly that as the 
password died with Ralphie, the only way to do this is by using something called a squid, technology used by the Navy during wars to hack enemy computers. Molly says that she knows a retired Navy veteran who might be able to help. Said veteran turns out to be a dolphin. Apparently, in the last World War, the US government genetically altered dolphins to make them human level intelligence or higher, then welded armor onto their bodies, implanted cybernetic computers into their brains, the before mentioned squids, then got them addicted to heroin and used them as a slave army to deactivate sea mines. One can only assume that Peter died out with the rest of the environment in this world. This dolphin, named Jones, has a retirement job working in a small dirty tank in an amusement park. Molly offers him a syringe full of pure heroin in exchange for using his squid to hack into Johnny's chip and discover the password needed to extract the files. Jones does so, so he gets to enjoy an injection of smack right into his head. Johnny and Molly then use the password to extract the data, record it, and send a message to the Yakuza telling them they have it. Molly then takes Johnny to a place that she knows they'll be able to see their assassin coming. She leads him up an hours long ladder climb to the top of the city's dome, to a massive cradle that's been constructed there from scrap by a group called the Low Techs, people who, as the name implies, eschew modern living wherever possible. They're old friends of hers and they let her use their little Thunderdome battle ring to fight the following assassin. Uh, yes, these particular Amish are a little bit bloodthirsty it seems. The killing floor, as it's called, has been connected together in a way that makes it tilt and swing up and down wildly and for some reason has been tuned and amplified to make as much noise as possible. Using her greater knowledge of the battleground to her advantage, Molly outmaneuvers the Yakuza clone and tricks him into cutting off his own hand with his microfilament weapon. Rather than let her finish him off, he leaps through a hole in the floor to fall to his doom miles below. The book ends after skipping to about a year later. Johnny decided to permanently live with the low techs and has gone into business with Jones the Dolphin. Jones has been using his squid to extract all of the data that has ever been stored in Johnny's head and using it to blackmail his former clients. They're both quite rich as a result, so Jones now lives in a swanky aquarium and has all the heroin he could ever want, so yay for him. I believe that Johnny mentions that he left the stolen info for the Yakuza to find and never heard from them again, so he assumes that they're cool. Unfortunately, in one of Gibson's next books, Neuromancer, Molly mentions that no, no they were not. Shortly after the story ended, the Yakuza sent another clone assassin who actually managed to kill Johnny this time. Hard luck, old boy. One thing I didn't mention in the synopsis is Ralphie Face is called such because he had surgery to adopt the face of his favorite rock star, Christian Wright of the Aryan Reggae Band, a big name in the race rock circuit. Back when this book was written, I'm sure the idea of a popular mainstream fascist movement was quite the outlandish dystopian fiction concept. Simpler times. You never find out exactly what was in Johnny's head in the book, because it doesn't really matter, it was just a MacGuffin to drive the plot. Johnny Mnemonic is a very short story, even by short story standards. I get the impression that Gibson was way more interested in setting up his cyberpunk world than Johnny himself, both because of Johnny's lack of character development and his ignoble off-page death between books. From what I've observed, stories like this can be perfect for film adaptations, with a rich world lore to work with, and a lot of wriggle room when it comes to the bare bones plot, a good writer and director can use a short story as a jumping off point to make a super memorable film. Unfortunately, that is not what we got. I want room service! How the hell did an adaptation written by the book's author end up as in-name only is a legitimate question you might have been asking for the last few minutes. Well, the answer is fairly simple and the culprit is the usual suspect. Studio interference. <laughs> Apparently, Longo and Gibson originally wanted to make a low-budget art film based on the book, but no one was interested in financing it. However, they were offered a high budget to make it into a mainstream action movie. According to interviews, the irony that they couldn't get a million dollars, but they could get $26 million was not lost on these gentlemen. Unfortunately, this tale of vision betrayal does not end there, as apparently the movie they made was still too artsy for the studio's liking, and according to Gibson, in the very last moments of post-production, they took over the editing process and recut the movie to to try to force the story into a format that would appeal to a wider audience. The resulting film was, as one might easily predict, messy as hell. Allow me to break it down for you. In the distant future of 2021, Johnny, last name unknown, is working as a data courier who transports sensitive or illegal information in the chip inside his head for high paying clients. In this version, however, the chip appears to be a tad more integrated into his organic brain, so he's had to suppress a huge chunk of his memories, most of his childhood for example, to make room for the storage space. With some technical fiddling, said storage space can accommodate a whopping 160 gigabytes of data. Yeah, 
almost as much as you can carry on a $30 portable hard drive. This film is one of those wonderful examples of people predicting the future really badly. Rather than thinking about what technologies might replace what they have now, the movie is filled with higher tech versions of whatever was around in the 90s. It's glorious, we're talking futuristic fax machines, VCRs, payphones and mini discs. They also included those ridiculous VR gloves that never came to be, and as you can see, they vastly underestimated how much data storage space would be an impressive amount of data storage space. Part of the reason I feel justified in mocking this is because Gibson was careful to avoid including dates and tech stats in the book. They created these gaps specially for the film. I'd also forgotten until re-watching this film that glorious, inescapable trend in 90s movies involving attempting to visualise the internet using really shitty CGI. It's a trope that I kind of love but also do not miss. But I digress. Johnny's world in the film is as equally dystopian as the one in the book, with corporations and organised crime having long ago become far more powerful than any sort of democratic government, causing massive economic recession, wars and devastation. Film Johnny evidently regrets his career choice as he's trying to save up enough money to have his chip extracted and get his memories back. Unfortunately, his handler, Ralphie, keeps moving the goalposts on him in regards to how much it will cost, so he has to take on one last job before he can get out of the game. His clients are some rather nervous gentlemen who wish him to carry their data from Beijing to Newark for them. Johnny goes through the apparently rather painful process of implanting the information into his head and has them randomly change the channel on the TV to select three images that will serve as the unlock password. Alas, he lied to them about his maximum capacity and stuffing 360 gig in there will apparently slowly physically injure him to the point where he will die if he doesn't get it out of his grey matter in three days or less. At this point, the Yakuza turn up and murder everyone except Johnny who fights his way out of the room and uses his mastery of disguise to escape. In the confusion, the password images are split up. Johnny gets the first, the bad guy's the second and the third is destroyed. On Ralphie's advice, Johnny goes to Newark and tries to find the guys who can extract the deadly information from his head, but his boss betrays him to the Yakuza and Johnny narrowly escapes their trap with the help of... J-Bone, the leader of the Low Techs, a gang of resistance fighters opposing the Yakuza and the mega corporations. FYI, the film's opening crawl immediately renders the Low Tech's name kind of ironic because they're described as hackers and data pirates, not exactly low technology professions. After J-Bone, Batman's away when Johnny's back is turned, babyface John Wick goes to try to get answers out of Ralphie but is immediately knocked out by his bodyguard. They strap him to a table so that Shinji, the leader of the Yakuza, can chop his head off and freeze it, but Johnny is saved by... Ah. At this point, I should mention an adaptation problem that was admittedly somewhat out of anyone's, even the studio's hands, namely copyright issues with the book's female lead, Molly Millions. Because she featured in several other books, the film rights to her character were separate and unobtainable by this film's producers, forcing them to make up a similar but legally distinguishable character called Jane. Jane is established in her own scene earlier in the movie. Like Molly, she's an augmented bodyguard for hire, but that is pretty much where these similarities end. Aside from her kick-ass eye mirrors and knife fingers, which, as you can clearly see, Jane lacks, what I personally think made Molly interesting is how little we actually knew about her. Her backstory and motivations were shrouded in mystery in the short story. It seemed at first like she was just helping Johnny strictly for the money, but it quickly became clear that she was thrilled that her opponent was so deadly because she really enjoys life or death challenges. Jane's motivations for saving Johnny are as clear as day. No one else would hire her because she has a disease called nerve attenuation syndrome, aka the black shakes. Something that's an ever-increasing percentage of the population has because, and I kid you not, there's just too much technology around and it's poisoning the airwaves. Yes, you can tell this film was written at exactly the same time that people were convinced that holding a cell phone to your head would literally cook your brain. Anyways, Ralphie is cut to pieces again, this time because he was a bit annoying. Johnny finds out the info in his head was stolen from a big pharma company, not subtly named PharmaCon, who hired the Yakuza to get it back. He tries to cut a deal with a company bigwig to return it to them in exchange for calling off the hitmen, but he can't make it to the meeting because Jane falls ill from the black shake, so he has to take her to a back alley doctor she knows called Spider. Spider manages to temporarily sort her out and takes a look in Johnny's head for him. It turns out what's currently in his chip is the cure for NAS that PharmaCon discovered years ago but didn't share because there's more more money in treating something than curing it. I should probably backtrack for just a second and mention that the CEO of Pharmacon, Takahashi, is another character in this movie. His storyline is focused around being a recently bereaved father in mourning who is being constantly nagged by a rogue artificial intelligence to stop being evil and do the right thing, and telling him that his company hid the cure that could have saved his daughter from him. When he gets tired of the Yakuza failing to capture Johnny, he hires a street thug who apparently thinks that he's Jesus but is utterly psychotic and addicted to upgrading his body with bionic implants. Robo -G 
Jesus interrupts Johnny, telling Spider that he doesn't give a fuck about half the world's population and only intends to save himself. Spider sacrifices himself to give them a chance to escape and tells them to run to a guy named Jones who can help them. They go to Jones's crib, which turns out to also be Low Tech's headquarters. One of their clumsy sentries nearly drops a flaming car on Johnny, which is the last straw for his self-control, and he takes a minute to rant about how he was never destined to live in the slums. He wants a life of luxury, damn it. He wants the high life. He wants room service! The low techs take him to Jones the Dolphin, who's fairly similar to his book counterpart aside from lacking the opioid addiction. He starts to help Johnny extract the info, but they're interrupted by an attack from a corporate hit squad. The low techs engage them in battle, Takahashi turns up personally with a gun and a katana just like any committed CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation would do, but is betrayed and shot in the back by Shinji. Johnny and Shinji duke it out, eventually resulting in Johnny using Shinji's own monofilament wire weapon to cut his head off. In a surprise move, a dying Takahashi gives Johnny the second password picture, possibly deciding in his last moments to try to stop more avoidable deaths like his daughter's. Bionic Christ also appears to fight Claire. She's beaten but saved by Johnny, then returns the favor by manually directing one of Jones's weapons at the Terma Savior, incinerating him. FYI, I really don't think Dolph Lundgren really gave his all to the jacked up son of the almighty's death whale here. Johnny goes back to trying to get the cure out of his head so the low techs can broadcast it worldwide, but without the last picture in the unlock code, his only option is for him and Jones to hack his own brain. The AI who was annoying Takahashi all the way through the movie turns up to help and must have appeared on his TV screen at some point because it turns out that she is the last picture needed. I'm not sure why she didn't just tell him this so he wouldn't have had to kung fu fight his own antivirus software, but whatever. Pharmacon technicians finally isolate and delete her after this, but the rebels have the cure now and transmit it to everyone. Despite having firmly established that this shouldn't happen until he gets the chip removed from his head, Johnny gets all his memories back. Big Pharma spontaneously explodes for no discernible reason. Johnny and Jane suddenly remember that they're a man and a woman in a movie, so they must be in love. And there's a brief fake out when it looks like Optimus Messiah is coming back to life, but it's only the low tech cleanup crew throwing him in the river. You may have noticed that there was actually quite a lot of the book in this supposedly in-name only adaptation, but I stand by the designation. Some of the book's setup and the plot might still be there, but it's so buried under the colossal garbage that came with it, the end result is unrecognizable. I especially didn't care for their decision to make Johnny more of an action hero and reduce his dependency on Jane for protection. Can't have a woman saving the day, good lord no. This is veering out of my remit a bit because it's gotten out to do with the adaptation process, but another big flaw in this film is the performance of its lead the currently much beloved Keanu Reeves. <laughs> You're breathtaking. You're all breathtaking. Despite previously stated opinions and uh, vicious mockery from me that we'll quietly ignore, I have been brought around to the opinion that Reeves is actually quite a good actor as long as he's well directed. I would even go as far as to say that he is in fact an actor who is exactly as good as his director and unfortunately in this case his director was a moonlighting painter. I'm sorry to say that the resulting performance is very much deserving of the Raspberry nomination it received. Final thoughts. So, a short story that was intended to be an art film that was changed to be a tongue-in-cheek comedy action movie that was then re-edited at the last minute to be an actual action movie that took itself far too seriously. Not so much lost in adaptation as lost in Hollywood bullshit. From what I've discovered about the backstory surrounding this film, it doesn't sound like a super loyal adaptation of the book was ever on the table, but the embarrassing mess that we got was certainly not the director's or the writer's vision. It is a shame, but at the end of the day, it's a very short story about a human USB stick who gets in over his head with organized crime and is saved by a much more interesting side character. I think that we can probably live without a good adaptation of Johnny Mnemonic. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Whether or not my small contribution to YouTube's monopoly of online content hosting will ultimately turn out to have been aiding in leading us towards a cyberpunk dystopian future like the one that Gibson envisioned is a question I shall leave for the historians, but until then, if you would like to help with my career on this Doom site, please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I shall hopefully see you in the next episode. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Aaron G. Dunsill, Sasha I. Edwards, and Shelby Holtz.
Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dom, I can't do that. A mysterious but handsome wizard wearing sunglasses informed me you're spending the money on a cannon designed to allow you to shoot puppies into the sun! And I have no reason to assume whoever that was was making it up for his own amusement. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode.